God, I thank you for anything and everything that I, I take for granted every day. God, before I ask you for anything, God, I just want to thank you for everything. God, I just pray this morning, God, that your spirit would be upon us this morning, God, that we wouldn't be able to move without feeling you, God. I pray, God, that we have come this morning prepared to worship, God, that we have spent time with you this morning. We spent time with you every day this week. And I just thank you, God, for giving us the, the freedom to gather corporately, God, and to worship you without persecution. And I thank you, God, for somebody uh, I think school that mentioned that there's a church on every corner just about down here. God, that doesn't mean that everybody's in church. I pray, God, people that are in this sanctuary in the back, God, I pray that that we would be welcoming to your spirit this morning, God, and I pray that, that we would not do anything to hinder your spirit. I pray, God, that we would not quench the spirit you say in first Thessalonians. God, I pray that, that our hearts would be open, God. I pray that you give us spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to help us see and hear what you want to what you have for us this morning. I pray for those that are hurting this morning. To come in here this morning hurting God. I pray the chains would be broken. I pray that you would break the chains. I pray that you would break the stronghold of God that we put up. So we first use them as a, oh, it's not going to hurt anything. And all of a sudden Satan blinds us to the point that we don't know it's a stronghold. I pray, God, that you would build the strongholds in our life, God, that we, we would lay them down at your feet and allow you to break them. I pray that we'd give them up and we wouldn't take them back. I pray, God, that you would that you would anoint this time as yours because you say in your word, where two or more gathered, you are here also. This is your house. This is your your church. I pray that we, we, would, we would allow you to work. During this time of fellowship, God, I pray that no one would be left untouched. I pray that we would greet each other with the Holy Spirit, God, as you say, as you say with the Holy Kiss, God. I just pray that we would take what you say in your word as the truth and not modify it, not change it to meet our own wants and needs. We would take it and we would apply it to our lives. <clears throat> and I pray, God, that, that no one would go without a hug, a handshake. And I pray, God, that the psychologists say today that, that a person needs at least eight hugs a day to have some type of meaning. But, God, you say that you provide all of them. And I pray that, that we would greet each other as true believers in Christ and I pray. Thank you. Come turn and greet each other.
that you, that you reveal yourself, that our reason is Christ. The reason I have a hope, the reason I have an answer, the reason I can be ready, that I can set apart Christ in my life, and that I don't have to be afraid, because your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out of me. God, I thank you for that truth. I thank you for that truth. God, I pray that you would be with us for us this time. In Jesus' name, amen. to the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory that is due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. And the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian, like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the hinds to calve and discovers the forests. In his temple, Doth everyone speak of his glory? The Lord sitteth upon the flood, or sits over the flood, or on it. Yea, the Lord sits king forever. He sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. The title this morning, can you hear me now? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name. We need you to speak. You speak in all different kind of situations and scenarios. And God, it's, it's, it seems like it's almost up to us to recognize your voice. Because your voice is almost always there. It's almost always relevant. It's almost always present. And God, the question I believe you would pose to us this morning is can you hear me now? God, I pray that you would speak for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. This particular passage is, if you were to just read it literally, you would think that it is beautiful. That it is uh, talking about someone's voice alone. And 
The beauty is that there is a relationship between one's voice and one's own self. It would be very, very hard to separate me from my voice, especially because you hear me sing all the time. And so automatically, you would associate me with my voice, good, bad, or indifferent. And so David, what happens with, with Psalm 29 is David uh, really uh, offers us a piece of literature that goes through the door, the channel, the thoroughfare of God's voice to describe God. It's one thing to describe God to a people that can't understand God. Because we're in the natural. We can understand aspects of God, but understanding Him in, in and of itself is it, uh, very, very difficult. Very, very difficult for us. So what does David do? He sets up a canvas. A canvas by which every human being on the planet can see the artwork in this text. Where everyone that is listening can say, hey, I know what a voice is. In fact, I have a voice. And so I can understand why David would, would paint us the picture of God using his voice as opposed to just saying the Lord is this, the Lord is that. Why? Because he wanted to reach down in the natural and he wanted to pull uh, some of us who aren't able to maybe see beyond the natural. And then he paints the picture of the Lord. And so the voice, the, the phrase, the voice of the Lord is mentioned seven times in this passage. What is the number of seven? What's the number seven? Number of perfection. What else? Completion. Wholeness. And so not only is David giving us a natural view of God through the voice of God, but he's also indicating that there's a wholeness and a completeness, not only in God's voice, but in God himself. In other words, there's, there's a thoroughness about God, that he doesn't leave any part out. In other words, there's no person that's attending the service that could not possibly fit into the description that David gives here. Uh, one of the things that David was doing, uh, really you can look at a text kind of three ways. You can look at it as literature and read it uh, literally, metaphorically, etc., you can read it literally as a piece of historical, um, as a historical document, or you can read it spiritually, and you can extract spiritual truth out of natural words. There's what's called a semiotic relationship between words and their meaning. And so what happens is we automatically ascribe meanings to various words. If I said the word blue, you may have a different shade of blue, but you know that that is a color that I'm referring to. Unless I'm calling you sad, then you know it's something different. And so there's a semiotic relationship in different words. And so David, he, he uses the voice of the Lord as not a play on words, not like he was playing, but it paints us a picture so that we can really go into depth and really understand, we can really comprehend God. The other thing that, that David was doing was he was addressing pagan Canaanite beliefs. There was a pagan god called Baal. Some of you have heard of him in, in the Old Testament stories. And this was a, he was the god of storms. He was the storm god. And in, Can in, in Canaanite text, in ancient uh, <clears throat> religious text, this god, this storm god Baal, would release thunder, and it was a seven peal full of, th of thunder. So in other words, it was a seven 
part series of thunder, essentially. And it accompanied lightning and all of these things. And so David was saying, not only am I going to talk about God, am I going to uh, uh, indicate through the voice of the Lord this supernatural, uh, powerful God, but what I'm going to do is I'm also going to counteract this pagan God, and I'm going to use my God's seven characteristics. In other words, your God may have thunder, but I'm going to show you what my God has. And so he paints this text in order to almost denounce Baal, Can the, the Canaanite uh, uh, region influenced a lot of people. If you notice, uh, if you, can, you can read um, Google search Canaanite and see what all the Canaanites influenced negatively or positively all throughout the world. And one big thing that they, that they offered was they offered this little G-O-D. And David says, I want to show you big G-O-D, capital G-O-D. There's not the article, a definite article, uh, or the. There's not uh, or the before my God. It's just G-O-D. There's no article that I need to describe my God. I just come straight out with it and tell you that he has seven characteristics that make him complete, that make him whole, not only in and of himself, but he's complete in your life and he's complete in my life. So we have this God that's thorough and complete in and of himself, but he's also thorough and complete in our lives. And so David was counteracting this Canaanite text. Now, the word Lord that's used, it's used uh, the uh, voice of the Lord, the word Lord there, there's a couple different instances of Lord. Uh, in the Old Testament, Adon or Adonai was a typical uh, description of the word Lord. And that was used several times in the Old Testament. But that's not the one he used. That means controller or ruler. There's another word, Lord, that was special. And some of you that have some uh, Bible sort of history background, uh, you will know that the lettering YHWH was very, very significant. In fact, when scribes were writing copies of the Bible, that's what scribes did. If you ever hear the word scribe, they, they scribed, they wrote, right? <coughs> They, they scribed the copies of the Bible. And every time that they would come to this word, Y-H-W-H, it didn't, it didn't even have vowels. Because they didn't know how to describe God accurately. And so this, it, there was these four letters that they ascribed to Lord, to Jehovah. And every time that they wrote the word Lord, they would have to get a new pen. Some of them went so far as to even change clothes. Now let me tell you, this word is listed 7,838 times. Them dudes went through a lot of pens, right? <laughs> or quills, feathers, whatever that. I guess they were quills with some ink. They didn't have the, the Gutenberg press yet, right? But this word was so... This word is special in the Jewish language. It's the only word in, in Hebrew I can't say the only word but one it's a, it's a word that is described in the Bible by Hebrews but never used in common Hebrew speech it's not used anywhere else but to describe Yahweh you've heard of the word Yahweh that's where we get Yahweh we added vowels in between the consonants in order to make it a English word that we could pronounce. Otherwise, it'd be like, you know, <laughs> or something like that. You know, we add vowels in order to make it speech, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jade. I knew I'd get one of mine. <laughs> but on a serious note, this word means it's, it can be used interchangeably with the word Jehovah, but it means self existent, one who's the covenant maker, 
the controller of earth and creator. It's self-existent. The Lord is not dependent on you or I having a good day for him to be God. Just thought, thought some of you need to know that. Sometimes I need to know that. You know, like this morning, I need to know that. <clears throat> the, the word Yahweh is a name recognized by Jews, historians, both ancient and contemporary, and scholars. <clears throat> and it's referred, it's what David uses in this psalm to describe the Lord. The word voice, as it relates to this psalm, the voice of the Lord, describes <coughs> kole, is the Hebrew word. That's the English transliteration of the word. A sound produced by vocal cords. In this context, it represents a voice which is attached to a covenant or an agreement. It's not necessarily literal voice. It's not necessarily a natural voice like we would think. The word kole is used in a natural sense. If I could say, uh, with my voice I sung a song, right? That would be the Hebrew word kole. But this is talking about not an inanimate, but a metaphorical voice that reaches back to describe the person it's relating to. So in other words, it's dependent on whoever it's describing. God's voice all throughout his word is associated with his will, with his word, and with his work. So in other words, one could never delineate between the voice of God and God himself because they are one in the same. David just invites us to look at the voice of the Lord to make it a little easier on our humanity so that we could possibly take grasp on God's deity, right? God is so uh, fantastic, meaning he, he's so awesome, that it's really hard for us to picture who God is unless someone like David breaks it down just a little bit so we can, not that we're uh, uh, not intelligent, that's not the implication here. The implication is that God is so far beyond intelligence. He's so far beyond reason. That's why atheists have such a problem believing in God because they try to reason their way into something that's supernatural. And you'll never get from natural to supernatural in your mind. That's why God comes and he invites you. Uh, he, he invites you to allow him to take over your heart. Because the heart is the epicenter according to the Bible. The heart is the epicenter of all emotional, social activity. Spiritual, obviously. Activity. It's the epicenter. It's the control tower. It's ground zero for the rest of our decisions, etc. And so why does the enemy go after the heart? He goes after the mind first because if you're occupied, then he doesn't have to get to your heart because he's got your mind. Let's say he can't get your mind. Then what does he go after? He goes after your heart. He goes after your desires. He goes after your wants and your needs. And so David says, here's, what, here's, here's my God. Let me describe my God for you. He says, first of all, in verse 3, go ahead and pull that first one up, please. He said that he's upon the waters. It says, the voice of the Lord is upon the water. David begins this uh, sort of theistic dissertation with a truth that is commonplace worldwide. In other words, everyone needs water to live. We all need water to live. You can't survive without water. You can go a little while, but you need water. According to the United States Geological Survey, 71% survey, of the earth is covered by water. Water is all over the earth. Water is extremely necessary for life. 
Over 400 billion gallons of water is used in the United States alone each day. 400 billion gallons. That's a lot of water. Of course, in the Middle East, Africa, some uh, less fortunate countries, water is a precious commodity. I see with my own eyes young, young people that had these um, empty uh, juice bottles. And I thought that they had filled them up with juice because it had like an orange, like a, it looked like apple juice, basically. And I said, you got some juice there? You know, thinking they had got some juice. They said, no, this is water. I couldn't believe it because they didn't have the advantage of clear water. So the earth is dependent on water. And so I think King David was, was hinting a few things. That first of all, God is over the earth. Because if, if God is upon the water, and water covers 70% of the earth, how much vast, more vast, must God be if He is upon the water? If someone is upon something, basically they have to have dominance over that thing to be upon it. Otherwise, that thing would be upon them in a in a, in a figurative sense, when someone is upon something that, that indicates that they have dominance. And basically, David was saying, there's water everywhere, and my God, he's even upon the water. That's how vast he is. Despite how much water there is on the earth, it doesn't come close to compare to how vast our God is. God is upon the water. And, and so if I, I, I think back to Mark and I think about the, 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 the disciples are on the boat. And all of a sudden a storm comes. And they run and wake Jesus up and say, get up, get up, get up. We're dying. And he called, he, 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 he gets up, he commands the water. And he says, man, why didn't you have faith? First of all, I created the water. You don't think I can calm it? Next, I'm on your boat. If you got Jesus on your boat, you're pretty safe in it. Hey, your boat may get rocky. You know, because on the water, I say God is upon the water, because on the water, you can have a storm. A water could be, um, there could be flood from that water. You could have the big wind uh, waves as a result of the wind. God is upon the water. So, in other words, David is indicating that all of these different manifestations in our life, all these different occurrences, that God is upon it. In other words, he hasn't lost control because there's confusion and chaos in our lives does not mean that God has lost control. It says that God is upon many waters. And, and, you know, I thought about it. There's so many types of water. you got salt water, fresh water, vapor, ice caps, ice cubes, rivers, oceans, groundwater, flood water, uh, tap water, all kinds of water. And it says that not only is he upon the water, which speaks uh, in a singular sense, but in a plural sense, he's upon the waters. So no matter what situation you and I find ourselves in, God is able to handle it. And David uses water because it's common. We all, we all uh, uh, drink it or uh, cook with it or bathe with it or something every single day. And so God has many forms that are relevant to us. And basically David is saying not only uh, is he upon the water, he controls it, he's over the earth, he controls it, but he's upon many waters. In other words, if you put all the water all together together, it still doesn't come close to the power and strength and majesty that God has. It says the voice of the Lord, verse 4, is powerful. The word powerful is kawak. Kowach. Kowak. Those are the different pronunciations. It's a uh, poetic word used in literature to show immensity. Literally, the word powerful, the English transliteration is force or capacity or the means or ability to carry out an action. Uh, the Blue Angels. Anybody ever seen Blue Angels? They're pretty, pretty awesome. Talk about power. They say that one of the Blue Angels' engines, 
just one blue angel, one of their engines, and each plane has two engines, has over 22,000 pounds of thrust. You know, they say something in... You don't measure plane's power necessarily in horsepower, but if you were to account for horsepower in a Blue Angel, you would say that one Blue Angel has more horsepower than the entire starting lineup at Daytona, which is 43 cars with approximately 800 to 1,000 horsepower. One Blue Angel has more horsepower than that entire starting lineup at Daytona. Obviously, David did not have jet fighters back in his day. But he still realized God's power. Why? Because he looked at the mountains and said, there's no way that these are so beautiful and so majestic randomly. He looked at the, you know, maybe the sea, he went to the, down to the Mediterranean Sea, and he saw huge crashing waves. And he said, it's no random chance that this, these huge, beautiful waves are coming. Or maybe he saw a Mediterranean uh, uh, rock cliff. And he said, there's no way that there's random chance that this beauty is, is on the earth. And he used the word that is capacity, means, or power. In Hebrews 4.12 it talks about a light giver. It says the word of God is quick, powerful, and sharp. The word quick is zalo to, to make lively or enliven, to make alive, to make active. The word powerful is the word energase, which means energy. We get our English word energy from. It means effective power. It means that it's very, very effective. And then you have the word sharp which is the word tomoteros, which means to cut away with repeated blows. If you're chopping a piece of meat, you use a meat cleaver, what if you can't get it all at once? Sometimes you have to go through a few times. And that's the idea of the word sharp in the Greek is tomoteros, to cut away as in repeated blows. And so the word gets introduced to our lives and, and all of a sudden, there's, it's constant blows. In other words, you may walk away and God may put something in your heart that he that either you read or you heard three months ago. And guess what? It's over and over and over. It's tumble terrors because the word of God is powerful. If his word is powerful, if his voice is powerful, imagine how powerful he must be. It also says that he is creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word universe, if you break it down, uni means one, verse means spoken sentence. Atheists use the term universe, which literally in Latin <coughs> means a single spoken sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How powerful <coughs> is our God? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The word power is the ability to execute an action. The word might is the authority to execute an action. And so not only does God have the ability to do it, but he has the right to do it. He can do whatever he wants. In Hebrews 1.3, it says that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. So he's an upholder. Extreme power. Then it says the voice of the Lord is majestic. The word majesty has the idea of a dignitary who comes in with a full garb, with headgear on, diamonds, uh, precious stones, gold. This is the idea. This is the picture that David used in describing God. So in the first half, of the verse, he said that he's powerful, and, and, and you think of these awesome uh, acts of power, but then the second half he said that he's majestic. And so what is this? It's a comparative analysis, because when you put the two words next to each other, polarity occurs. In other words, they're, they're opposites. You have God's amazing power, who's able to create the Grand Canyon. He 
and create huge oceans. But he's majestic enough. If, if you ever thought about this, if, if gravity, if the earth, earth is round, right, and gravity is pushing water, earth, and sky all together, how does the sky not get into water? How does water not take over all the land? You know, if the ocean, if it, say it was drained, and it went over the earth, do you know that in just the oceans, it would be able to cover the entire surface of the earth over a mile deep? If the oceans were let out, there's enough water in the oceans for the entire surface of the earth to be covered a mile deep. Why does that not happen? How come the sky doesn't interfere with the ground? And the water doesn't overlap. It says, because God upholds all things by the word, by just a word, he created it all, and then he keeps it all together. Just think, you can believe that there's no God, but then you have to believe that this planet is traveling, however fast, very, and spinning. And if we get off just a degree to the north, well, you can go either way, but you'll burn up just a degree to the south, and you'd freeze to death. It's capped perfectly. It's on a perfect access. If you believe that there is no God or that he's not uh, interested in humanity, then you have to believe that some random something is holding this entire universe together. How does the water not cross over into land? It's because God said, stop right there, and it has to stop. So if he can command the oceans to stop right there, then why can't you look into your life and stop something that's, that's bothering you? Why can't you look into your heart and heal something that's ailing you? He can. And that's what David's saying, that this powerful, awesome God that created everything is majestic and gracious. He's this dignitary. It's the idea of a powerful Lord who speaks grace to his followers. We measure bite force with PSI. A human bite is 150 to 200 PSI. <clears throat> it would hurt if, if you got bit, obviously, if anyone's ever been bit, it hurts. An American alligator weighs 800 pounds. On, you know, on average. I, maybe not average, but can get up to. And can get up to 13 foot. <coughs> it has a bite strength of 2,100 PSI. Pounds per square inch. <coughs> Coming down. Over 10 times our own bite strength. And you know what? It can carry <coughs> its little young in its mouth. How in the world can it do that? Because it's a beautiful balance between power and majesty. We have some pictures on this planet of some extremes. How a several ton elephant will stop its, its baby elephant. How it's nimble enough to walk around. You ever see a dog, if there's something in the way, it's, don't even look at it and it goes around it. How's it able to do that? It's got, it's got grace. It's got majesty. And that's the picture that David's trying to, trying to use here. That God, the same God who has resurrection power, also has majesty. And I wish I had time to, to really get into this. i got to move on. Number four says he breaks the cedars. <coughs> Even the cedars of Lebanon. Do you have that Isaiah crystal by any chance? I just turned to it. Isaiah 2, 13 and 14. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, 
This is basically God is talking about how he will bring down. But the cedar of Lebanon, the Lebanon was a very, very famous tree. It's in a Lebanon is a country in the Middle East. You hear the Lebanese? Well, formerly they were Phoenicians. The Phoenicians in, in, in antiquity were great seafarers. In other words, they were great sailors. They built these huge wooden ships out of their cedars and out of their oaks. They built these huge ships and they were world renowned. The, the Phoenicians used them. The Egyptians used the cedars. The Sumerians used the cedars. The Hebrews used the cedars. Cedars represent something that's very, very identifying. And so if we're not careful, here he says that God breaks, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Basically, what is he saying? He's saying if you have an identity problem, that God will break it. Or God can break it if you want it to be broken. Cedars are also very, very tall trees. These represent high things in our life. You know the song, every high thing must come down. Every strong shall be broken. That's the idea. The idea of break means to shatter utterly. utterly. Imagination. Cedars represent imaginations. Cedars also re represent um, interest and insecurities. Cedars also uh, represent importance. It's a... Don't be on the way. Importance is a spelling error. Anyway. Cedars represent, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know y'all were in it and then I switched. I switched gears too quick. I'm sorry. I got to let y'all know first. Um, but anyway, cedars represent importance. The, the cedar tree was on, uh, maybe is on the flag. I, I guess it's present day Syria, the Syrians. And so the cedar tree uh, is an idol, it's an identity, it's an insecurity, and it's an importance. All right, go to the next one, number five. It says in number five that he divides the flames of fire. The, the word divide means to cut up, to hew, to distribute flashes of lightning. The Department of Atmospheric Sciences says that there are approximately 1,200 thunderstorms at any given time. Over 100 flashes of lightning per second. Every second. Each lightning bolt has 15 million volts. 15 million volts in one lightning bolt. It says that it, it heat, one strike of lightning heats up the air to approximately 60,000 degrees. Even in some cases, uh, research, researchers say that the air is heated up to around 100,000 degrees Fahrenheit by one lightning strike. Job 38, 35 says, can you send, he, God is challenging Job. He said, can you send forth lightning? I can. Does lightning go, come back, and report back like, hey, we're ready to go wherever else you need us to go. And he's challenging Job. Can you do that? Because this God that we're talking about today He's able to do that. He's able to assign the lightning exactly where it's supposed to go. That's the idea that he divides the flames of fire. Ovid, the, the poet, says that th this is a nimble stroke of quick cross lightnings. Literally, what he's saying here is that God is able to open the clouds and send forth a lightning bolt, bolt that has 15 million volts in each one. And God is literally able to assign it where it should go. So what is that saying? First of all, God can make order out of chaos. If we have chaos in our lives, God can make order of that thing. God can make a light 
lightning. God can make a light in the darkness. How about God can make a path? He can make a way. He's your way maker. You don't see a way, God's the way. He's able to make a way for you. You may not know what your way is. Why don't you ask him? And then you wait on him to give you the answer. It's like Robert preached, be still. Number six, God shakes the wilderness. Literally to cause to dance or make to tremble, to dance, to move, or to quake. The, the picture here was that Lebanon and Syria would have a countrywide earthquake because of the voice of the Lord. That is the picture that David's given here. So not only is he in power and he's majestic and, and he's able to assign lightning bolts, but with the sound of his voice, he can cause an entire country to have an earthquake and quake at the sound of his voice. You could also say that shake in the wilderness. The wilderness may be barren. It may be monotonous. It may be a time in life where you're complacent or comfortable. God has the ability to shake that thing up. Or maybe you need uh, something else to happen in your life. You need a breakthrough. God has the ability to, to make the break in your life. Last one. It says that he causes pines to cap and discovers the forest. Uh, another translation says that he causes the oaks. Remember, oaks were really famous. The oaks of Bashan and the cedars of Lebanon. He causes the trees to tremble with just his voice and strips the forest bare. So what is he saying? In the first application, the hinds, the calf, uh, it's, it's very difficult sometimes for deer to give birth. They struggle and it takes them quite a long time. Sometimes they, they end up having trouble. And so what, what is God saying? He's saying, if you're having difficulty uh, producing stuff in your life, and his voice can give you the wherewithal to be able to bring light where there was no light. And it says that he discovers the forest. Literally, he strips the forest bare. So, what is David saying? Is that this God that is full of power, that is full of majesty, that is full of grace and loving kindness, he can cause life or he can take a dense wooded forest and strip that thing bare with just the sound of his voice. And so whether you need light in your life, or you're training dangerous ground, either way, the voice of the Lord is apropos, appropriate for every situation that came in here today. There's no situation that you're facing that God cannot handle. And specifically, David comments that his voice is able to do all of these things. How much more can the person of God, whom we are called to have relationship with, how much more can we have relationship with him? How much more can, can that God, God himself, how much more can he do if the voice alone can do all these things? Pete, uh, Jesus met Peter um, on the uh, shore. Ms. Patty, you can come up. And praise him. But Jesus meets Peter on the, uh, or meets the disciples on the shore. And Peter had just denied Jesus, right? Y'all remember that when he did that? Okay. So Jesus shows back up. And all of a sudden, John recognizes. He said, it is the Lord. Peter did two things. First of all, he put on his outer garment. Because when the presence of God is there, you know, us being naked is, is shameful because the reality of our, our present estate 
is very, very uh, uh, discouraging in the presence of Almighty God, right? But then he jumped out of the boat. See, Jesus had already called him out of the boat twice. His initial call, he called him out. And then his second call, he called him to walk on the water. And then the third time, he finally said, Peter, when are you going to learn that you cannot get back in the boat? And so for a third time, Jesus calls him out of the water. This time, Jesus didn't have to say anything because Peter jumped. And when, when, he get, when Jesus first got up to, to the guys, he said, children, are you catching any fish? In other words, how's it working out for you going back to the old life that God has called you away from? How's it working out for you to keep banging your head on the same stupid thing over and over and over? Do you have any fruit? Do you have any positive results from doing the very thing that God has called us out of? And so my, my, I guess my charge, can you hear him? His voice is speaking in all of your lives, in all of your situations. And he's, he's, some of you, he's calling you up to him for the first time and saying, what are you waiting on? I'm the God who created all this that wants a relationship with you. Why? I don't know. I have no clue why a perfect God would want to fool with us. I don't know. But he does. You know how I know? Because he rescued me. Because I was the one down in the ditch rejecting God. And he showed back up. And you know what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? You know, he didn't call him Peter. Peter was the name that Jesus gave him. You know why I feel like he did that? Because he wanted Peter to know that, Je that he recognized that he was still human. And that he realized that he messed up. And that he, because he's human, he's going to mess up. In other words, he was picking Jesus, uh, Peter up. He was saying, Peter, get up. You don't have to be down. I know you turned your back on me. I know you messed up. But, but, but get up. And he said, do you love me more than these? Peter responded, yes, Lord, I fillet and love you, which is brotherly love, not godly love. And, and Jesus asked him three times because he wasn't getting it. There's something about Peter in three. Three denials, three calls out of the boat. And then Jesus calls him three times. Do you love me more than these? The word love that Jesus was using was agape. He's saying, do you unconditionally love me more than these? Because there's sensual love that's competing for your love with God. There's world, the world's uh, lust and, and pleasures and all these things. And then you have the brotherly love. But it's not God's love. And finally, he said, yes, a light bulb finally came on. And he said, yes, Lord, I unconditionally love you more than these. And that's the question today. Do you love him more than these? Uh, whatever your these is. I know what my these is. What is your these? Can you hear me now? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, y'all stand with me. Jesus, say God. <laughs> God, we just need you. I mean, there's just no other way around it. We just need you. 